On September 24, 1983, 11-year-old Sabrina Bowie was brutally raped, strangled to death, and left in a soybean field in rural North Carolina by two young men. One of those men was Leon Brown, a 16-year-old African-American who was sentenced to, to death for the death of that little girl. Brown's brother, 19 at the time, with his mother crying outside of the interrogation room, was questioned for five hours without access to a lawyer. In that time, he confessed to the murder and implicated his brother in the process. This past September, after 30 years in jail, the Brown brothers, now 46 and 50 years old, were free. New DNA evidence proved that they were innocent. This story is too common in our judicial system. Unfortunately, not all of those wrongly convicted are free before their execution, and that leaves the system to grant posthumous pardons to those who are later found innocent. I've spent the last several weeks researching the death penalty. I've talked to lawyers, read books, government documents, and evaluated arguments for both sides. Today, I will argue why Congress should abolish the death penalty because of its many problems. First, I will discuss three reasons why the death penalty should be abolished. The cost to taxpayers, the inherent unfairness and racial biases, and its failure to deter crime. Then, I will explain the solution. The death penalty is problematic for society. First, let's talk money. The cost to taxpayers for a person sentenced to death is higher than the cost for someone serving a life sentence. According to the Congressional Research Service's report for Congress on capital punishment, the extra cost per death penalty imposed is over a quarter million dollars, and per execution exceeds two million. Deathpenaltyinfo.org cites a study showing that in California alone, the death penalty has cost taxpayers over four billion dollars since 1978. They state that if the governor commuted the sentences of those remaining on death row to life without parole, it would result in an immediate savings of 170 million per year, with a savings of five billion over the next 20 years. Now let's talk about the color of justice. The death penalty is applied arbitrarily without consistency and is very racially biased. According to the NAACP, over 40% of the death penalty inmates are black. That's a huge problem considering only about 10% of the US population are African American. The NAACP also addresses those who are later proven innocent. Their website states that over 130 people have been freed from death row since 1973 due to evidence of their innocence after being sentenced. Nearly 40% of death row inmates who were ultimately freed because of new evidence were African Americans, and 35% of those executed and later found innocent were also black. In fact, a recent study put together at Cornell School of Law indicates that the darker the accused's skin color, the higher the likelihood that they will be sentenced to death. Now, let's talk about deterrence. The system is inherently flawed and doesn't achieve its goal of deterrence. One reason that it doesn't deter crime is because of the mental dispositions of those who do the crimes that would earn the death penalty. Eric Friedman, a professor at Hofstra University School of Law, explains that people who commit capital murders generally do not engage in probability analysis concerning the likelihood of getting the death penalty if they are caught. In other words, those who are motivated and capable of committing these crimes aren't mentally stable enough to understand the gravity of their situation. In fact, Friedman explains, they may be severely mentally disturbed people, like Ted Bundy, who selected Florida for his final crimes because it had the death penalty. Those in the police force also agree that the death penalty is not a deterring factor. According to deathpenaltyinfo.org, over two-thirds of the nearly 400 police chiefs surveyed did not think the death penalty significantly reduced the number of homicides. When asked what the most effective ways of deterring crime were, they identified the need to reduce the prevalence of drug use as their first priority. They also advocated longer prison sentences for criminals, fewer technical legal barriers toward the prosecution of criminals, more police officers on the street, a better economy with more jobs, and reducing the number of guns, all instead of an expanded use of the death penalty to deter violent crime. The problems are significant, clear, and numerous, but the solution is quite simple. We must abolish the death penalty. In order for this death penalty to be abolished, we need to urge our Congress to eliminate the system. Many people will argue that the death penalty should be used because it is an equal punishment for the crime or crimes committed. In other words, the concept of an eye for an eye. To this, we should return to a concept briefly mentioned earlier, wrongful convictions and executions. <coughs> wrongful convictions can come from bad eyewitness testimony, improper informants, 
improper forensic science, false convictions, confessions, and incriminating state statements, according to the Innocence Project. The Innocence Project also found that since 2000, there have been over 250 exonerations based on new DNA evidence. That's 250 individuals who would have been legally and wrongfully murdered by the system. Now let's examine where the US sits in the pantheon of civilized countries. According to antideathpenalty.org, anti the US, China, and North Korea are among the few countries in which the death penalty still survives. No European, South American, or other North American countries were found on that list. So we would not be paving the way in abolishing the death penalty, but rather joining numerous forward-thinking nations in doing so. With heated debate from both sides, it's important to understand the research behind why we should call on Congress to remove this system. The death penalty should be abolished by Congress because it is not cost-effective, it is racially biased, and it does not achieve its main goal of deterrence. Now, let's return to the Brown brothers, the men freed for a murder they never committed but were accused of and sentenced to death for when they were only in their teens. In a system that seeks to find justice for everyone involved, can we really defend a punishment that leaves that little room for error? The death penalty should not be applied if we cannot be 100% fair and certain that the evidence and conclusions we are making are correct. I urge you all to examine this issue a little more carefully and at least be a little more educated the next time that this debate takes center stage in the political realm. Thank you.